light is a bit dicey these days. Spoilers ahead for the Obi-Wan Kenobi series on Disney+. Plus. The very last thing we see in the Obi-Wan Kenobi Disney Plus series is Obi-Wan finally making contact with Qui-Gon Jinn. But what about the last time they speak together? That's a story you can find in Star Wars from a certain point of view. 40 stories celebrating 40 years of Star Wars. The story starts while old Ben Kenobi and Luke are on their way to Anchorhead, when they come across a destroyed sand crawler. Afraid that his aunt and uncle might be in danger, Luke races off to warn them, against Obi-Wan's wishes. The movie follows Luke from this moment, but the short story explores what Obi-Wan was up to off-screen. It's revealed that old Ben summons his master by calling out his name, awakening Qui-Gon Jinn's consciousness. And I love the way that Claudia Gray describes Qui-Gon's emergence from the cosmic force, and regaining his form. Qui-Gon feels his bones being covered in muscle, his skin and hair wrapping his frame, and the robes he once wore pulling back together so that when he appears, he lifts his hood to take in his former apprentice. But when he lays eyes on Obi-Wan, he sees more than the old hermit we know from this time period. Qui-Gon can see Obi-Wan, master on the Jedi Council, general of the Clone Wars, inquisitive young Padawan. Every instance of Obi-Wan Kenobi was with Qui-Gon Jinn in that moment. Each was as real as old Ben. And while it was Qui-Gon who returned, time in the nether realm of the Force has changed him. Qui-Gon notes that lifetimes seem irrelevant to him now, rather it's a being's journey through the Force that truly matters. When the two get to talking, it becomes clear this is but one of several interactions that they've had on Tatooine. He tells Obi-Wan that Luke's destiny lies far beyond the Lars homestead. This shocks Obi-Wan, who then asks his master if he's seen the future. Qui-Gon replies by nodding his head and surprising himself. He's starting to feel again, to express himself using a physical body. He can smell the ashes of the Jawas being piled up on a pyre by R2 and 3PO behind him, at the same time from the devastation of the Lars homestead. Igon feels the pain and loss of Luke at the sight of the only family he's ever known, reduced to blackened bone. He senses Obi-Wan feels this pain as well. If you're wondering why Qui-Gon seems to show up now just to chat with Obi-Wan, well he explains that too in this chapter. He'd always been able to communicate with others. We see that in the Clone Wars when he reaches out to Yoda. But after the events of Revenge of the Sith, Qui-Gon chose to re-emerge because he didn't want his friend to be entirely alone in the desert. And so after all this time, after untold conversations with Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon still holds on to shame and remorse over making his apprentice train Anakin Skywalker before he was ready. Qui-Gon wishes to express this remorse, but his comprehension goes far beyond what he now considers crude language, and so he decides to wait, until the two are reunited in the Cosmic Force, and words are no longer necessary between them. If we take a moment just to look way too deep into this, it's not hard to imagine that that's how Anakin made amends with the likes of Yoda and Obi-Wan to rejoin them as ghosts on Endor. There was no apology necessary because they're all one with the Force now. Qui-Gon senses Luke's return and understands that he'll be reunited with Obi-Wan shortly. What matters most now is that Obi-Wan focuses on Luke and the path laid before them. And so, the last thing Qui-Gon says to his friend is that they will see each other again soon. As he goes, we learn it takes a great deal of effort to physically manifest as a force ghost. Qui-Gon releases his focus on Obi-Wan, sensing the living creatures in the Dune Sea and the warmth of the Twin Suns. He releases his grip on his physical body, relinquishing his name, and sinks back into the Cosmic Force.